Hi and welcome to the next installment of It's In The Mind, It Can Be Managed with Priority Mind Management. We've got another one of our coaches uh, uh, on today. I'm extremely excited about this one as I am with all the coaches that we get on um, because we get to talk about a different subject. Now the title of, t and this one, this one, not it, it didn't trigger me, but this one is like, this is exactly what we've been talking about. Uh, I'm trying to help people with mind management. And we all know that if that label doesn't empower you, it's a disempowering statement. So today's podcast is about labels are for tins. Or in America, you would say labels are for? Cans. Cans. <laughs> oh, you say cans. Uh, so look, <laughs> let's get started. Let's welcome to the podcast uh, one of our extremely talented, highly qualified coaches all the way from Arizona. Arizona, the hottest place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the way from Arizona, we have Mary Denise. Mary Denise, uh, an amazing coach at Priority Mind Management, serving so many people. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mary Denise. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm super excited. I absolutely love everything that you are doing in the mind management field. And I'm so excited to be a part of it because you know what? If you can't, if you can't manage your mind, you can't manage anything else in life. Um, my name is Mary Denise, and I do live here in the wonderful greater area of Phoenix in Arizona. And I have been practicing as a mind management coach for quite some time, but I didn't actually adopt the title of my management coach until about almost a year ago. Um, I've got a lot of background in neuro-linguistics programming. I mean, I've taken every course under the sun to hone my skills as a coach. I'm also a certified team member of the John Maxwell Group. So I got to train under him for a little while and it, has, it was an amazing experience. Um, like I'm just, I'm geeked out on the science of self-talk because it's what we talk about. It's what we believe about ourselves. It's what, what, what guides us and drives us. And if we have a really bad inner critic, and I like to call it the bully between the ears, if we have a bad inner critic, then we're not going to be able to put our best foot forward and live the best life that we can possibly live. Therefore, we will stay stuck in the conditions and circumstances of our life. The bully between the ears. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I call the monkey mind. Mm -hmm. It's yep. absolutely horrible. It's vile. It just absolutely demolishes our self-worth, our spirit, our soul, our identity. It's and do you know what? This is that I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use your words again. The bully between the ears is what makes people think that they are have a mental illness. That is actually why people, I did. Way back in the day, I was scared to talk about it. I was like, well, what's going on up here is so much more vicious than anything going around. I, I was scared to go and see a doctor, but I, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, the bully between the ears. People don't understand it. They're scared to talk about it. It's, it's one of those things that when you do talk about it, we release it and we're like, ah, oh, now I can manage it. Now I can start really, really uh, working on those things. So, you, uh, you, you, I know you live in Arizona now, but you're not originally from Arizona, right? No, originally, no. <laughs> Funny story there. I'm originally ah. from Texas. <laughs> right. So originally, I'm from Texas. I spent the first 18 years of my life in Texas. Then I went and traveled the world because I was married to a soldier. Ended up in Alaska, where I claim Alaska as my true home because I was there for 20 years, and I still have grandchildren, and one of my sons lives there. So now I'm here. <laughs> Where about in Alaska? Uh, Fairbanks, the interior of Alaska, the most beautiful part of Alaska, in my opinion. When I used to work on the cruise ships, I used to sail around Alaska. Uh, mm -hmm. and if anybody ever says, where should I, where should, should I sail? Alaska. Yep. Amazing. Absolutely. Yep. Ketchikan we used to go to. Ketchikan. Absolutely love Alaska. Fantastic place. Yep. So why, why did, because a lot of people are like, well, what is mind management? And, the best way to, exp I'm not going to explain what mind management is, actually. 
because you've gone through the training and you've seen the effects that you get and the outcomes that you get with with mind management mm -hmm. and why it's different mm -hmm. to therapy and counseling Absolutely. um what why does mind management work for you it works for me because it puts it puts me in the driver's seat, right? I'm not depending on a therapist or a doctor or a prescription or anything to guide me through my day and get me out of the fog. It literally gives me accountability for myself and it causes me to really dig deep into the layers of the whys. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I believing this? Well, what what is true about what my adoptive mother said when I was a little girl. Why did that stick with me for so long? Well, what what was true about this? Like, it just really makes you take a deep look inside of you. It's like, you know, peeling the onion, like you're peeling the onion and you're peeling the seed of the onion to that point. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love that. That's a, such a great way. So a lot of people are asking and they come in and they come and talk to me. Well, why, why is my management different? What is my management? And you just mm -hmm. absolutely nailed it. And there's no stigma with it because it is coaching. Mm -hmm. it, the beautiful of it is it's, it's coaching. Mm -hmm. And what we've always tried to say is that counseling has got a place. Absolutely. Counseling has got a place. Mm -hmm. Life coaching has got a place because we're not life coaches. We're mind management coaches. It's, there's, there's mm -hmm. a difference. It's a really powerful thing that we can do to help. And working with, you know, a lot of people said, oh, can, how come we can work with trauma? Actually, when you break down what trauma is, and you break it down to a really simple understanding, mm -hmm. it actually becomes really easy to understand. It's like, all oh, right, okay. Fair. I mean, I, I know when I we would do the training, I said, so I had a person with trauma, uh, and we, we did this. And they were like, this is what I unlocked. Like, oh, my God, is it really that easy? Yes, mm -hmm. it is actually that easy. And I did it in, I, I'm trying to get that lady on for a podcast because I did it in 25 minutes. And even I was sat there going, oh, it's 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 done. 25 minutes, it's done. What are we going to do for the next five sessions? Um, <laughs> so, and it was like, oh, no, but we did other things that we, 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 we've we got from mind management, which is such a powerful tool for, for people. Um, and she went on to break on world records. So, yeah, you're absolutely right about the power of mind management, why it's so powerful helpful beneficial to people it really is such a cool thing to do uh if people are invested so let's come back to the to the title of the podcast which was really i did a post for on linkedin for it and i i i credited you to it because i'm like that's absolutely fantastic i did not take any uh, uh praise for that at all like no no one of our coaches absolutely dropped this and i was like boom there it is Labels are for tins or as you would say labels are for cans talk to me about why labels are for cans so it, it's funny how that came up for me. It came up about a year and a half ago. I was talking with a dear friend of mine and she's a, she works in the school district in, in California. And we were talking about the behaviors of some of the children that she deals with and special needs children and things of that nature. And I remember making a comment. I, I said something, I don't remember exactly what it was, but she said, Mary Denise, labels are for cans. They're not for people. It really drives me crazy when people say, oh, that person is this, that person is that. And it really made me start to think. And I was like, oh my God, what an amazing perspective. Labels are for cans, they're not for people. Too often we're told, Here, here's an example, in childhood, if you fall down all the time, you're told what? You're clumsy. That's a label that's put on you, you're clumsy. So therefore, every time you fall, I'm clumsy. But what if there's a medical reasoning behind why you're always falling? You'll never know because you are automatically placed with the label of I'm clumsy. Or if you don't do something, you know, your grades are not good in school or you're you're not keeping your home clean or you're not doing whatever. Oh, you're lazy. Or, oh, this or, oh, that. Like you just get put with all these labels or you're not a team player. That's my favorite one. I've been told that before. You're not a team player. Mm, what's a team player? How am I not being a team player? That is a label that is put on a person that then it carries on throughout life until they recognize that those words are not them. Those labels don't define them. They define themselves. I love that. So what kind of labels has your bully between the ears labeled you with? So my bully 
labeled me worthless, not good enough, stupid, um, a perfectionist, just all kinds of things. And a lot of that stemmed from my experiences in childhood. Mm -hmm. Fat, ugly, you're too dark, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> And that's that's the inner self talk, right? Mm -hmm. It's harsh. It's horrible. Yeah. Thank you, honestly. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank yeah. you for sharing because it's important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those are the labels that we put on ourselves too. Yeah, you know. Oh my God, I'm just so. Oh, I just I can't do it. I can't. I can't do it. I'm not smart enough. You know, we're putting those labels on ourselves when we do that. What are the labels? Because, I, you know, labels come from, so, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody and I was like, you know, most people are not who actually they are or should be because they they become the makeup of what other people have said to them through their lives. Mm -hmm. And us as human beings, unless we, so I'll use an example and I'll, I'll, I'll use my parents as an example because they don't listen to the podcast, so it's fine. <laughs> they won't even listen to the podcast. I don't even know if they would know how to file the podcast. And it, I just was on holiday for some, and one of my labels has always been, and it does pop up, it does pop up, and I always speak to Graham about it, is if you're successful, you'll be arrogant. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always, like, asking Graham, is that arrogant? No, it's like, no, no, that's just confidence. That's what you're supposed to be doing, right? Okay, fair enough. And I was always like, I don't know where this arrogance thing comes from until I went to see my mum and dad at the weekend. And the first two conversations she had was, oh, he's arrogant, and he's arrogant, and he's arrogant. And I ju it just hit me like a sledgehammer because I know what my core values are. And I'd said mm -hmm. to I'd said to Graham when I'm, I'm doing stuff with other people, I'm like, oh, your arrogance always pops up for me and stuff like that. And I, it always pulls me back. And I'm like, hang on a minute. I know that my values are integrity, compassion, love, and family. And I always stick to that. So where does the I just didn't know where this arrogance thing come from. Because I'm always quite chirpy and jovial and and bounce into a room and stuff like that, um, and it was the it was my mum. I just I, I said to my wife that that's that's what's been yeah, okay. and I didn't know where that label was coming from, and that's what had stopped me moving forward and past in in, in the future uh, and in the present and stuff. And I was like, oh, it's been my mum, it's been my mum for years, and I started doing mind management internally on mm -hmm. my on my mum. So I started listening to a language of fear. I started listening to the, the the conversation. And I asked, I went, why is that person, according to you, arrogant? And then she rattled yeah. off the reasons why. And I was like, oh, my God, she's projecting. She's projecting. She's projecting all that stuff onto someone else. I'm like, yeah. that's mind management, but you can't do it with people. That's what, that's that's the beauty of mind management is you can do mm -hmm. it silently. You can you can absolutely give a complete mock-up of, of somebody like, oh, my God, I can, now I can see it. I can see it. It's like getting behind the matrix and then opening it up and I'm like, right, now I can work it mm -hmm. on myself. I'm like, right, now mm -hmm. I can do that with myself. Absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Right. So that's the power. That is that is the beat. You're absolutely right with, with, with everything that goes on. That that inner, inner critic and inner, inner bully and the conversations you have, oh, if you do that, you're going to be this. And you're like, nobody knows that you're having these conversations. <laughs> and you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, I know it's me monkey mind. I've always labeled it as me monkey mind. But the inner... The bully between the ears. That's a fantastic. We all have the critics. We all have mm -hmm. the critics. Mm -hmm. So now we and I did it. We did a fantastic podcast with Paloma, uh, one of our other coaches, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the labels, which is when you said labels for cans, because people will repeat, "I have anxiety, mm -hmm. I have anxiety, I have anxiety," or "I have I'm, I struggle with my mental health." These are the labels that we create, mm -hmm. and I'm always packed up. So, so when you somebody says so to you, "I have anxiety," what does that for you go? For you, Mary Denise, how do you like, oh, please, please work with me. Please work with yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's really easy because a lot of times, you know, as soon as I hear, I've had anxiety for years. Okay, well, what, tell me what anxiety looks like for you. And then they'll start explaining it. And I'm like, huh. And you've had this for how long? Okay. So what happened in your childhood that caused you to start thinking you had anxiety oh well my mom told me my mom you know my mom took me to the doctor and they said that I suffer from anxiety and then they said I suffer from depression and then they said I suffer from ADHD 
Oh, okay. So tell me what you like to do. <laughs> and, you know, we start peeling that onion and then it turns out it's, it's not anxiety. It's just, they're not comfortable in their own skin. They don't know how to do things and think for themselves because they've been so ingrained to believe and think like somebody else. <laughs> oh, airs on the back of my neck, Mary Denise. <laughs> this is my management. I think you're giving away too much right now. You're giving away too much. Everyone's going to be walking around going, oh, I'm cured. <laughs> but that is the goal of priority of my management is to help people understand that actually, yeah, no. I, oh, yeah, yeah, the amount of times we have that conversation. All right, so tell mm -hmm. me a time when you didn't have it. Do you know one of the things that we I did with one of, one of my clients, um, and it was a phenomenal one because she told me she had anxiety and a long time. I said, okay, wait, just tell me where you feel anxiety. Oh, it's always in my stomach. Right, okay. Do you like roller coasters? And she's like, oh, I love roller coasters. I'm like, oh, right, okay. Where do you get the feeling when you're going on a roller coaster? Oh, it's in my stomach. And what is that? She went, oh, that's excitement. Okay. And the second I said that, it's the same feeling, isn't it? I was like, yep, it's the same thing. <laughs> yep. She went, so I've not got anxiety, I've got excitement. I went, you've got extreme uh, excitement. Next time you see, it's the label. Again, it's the yeah. label. You've got extreme yeah. excitement. The next time you're going somewhere you've never been before and you say, I have anxiety, you have extreme excitement for being in a new area. Mm -hmm. She texted me back. She called me back about two weeks. And she went, I've not had anxiety for two weeks. I've had extreme excitement. I'm like, there you go. Enjoy yourself. Have a great life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all a shift in perspective, right? It's like, yeah. let's let's stop believing what, we've been taught to believe and yeah. you know i'm not knocking you know that the lessons that we're taught is child in childhood because we learn and we do based on what our parents taught us because of what they learned and did and they did it because of what they learned and did you know it's, it's just a cycle that continues but at some point we have to be able to break that cycle yeah. so that we're not carrying it forward into future generations and we can at least enjoy what's left of our lives and our beings like it's just it's just something that we have to learn to do for ourselves and I think that if people would do that I think we'd have a kinder gentler and more compassionate world because people would see things they would see people as people right not as labels not as you know oh you're the the, the screw up you know you're the screw up of the family you're the black sheep of the family you're the you know you're the dreads of society basically you know like if we could just manage our own minds and, and figure out that we are not who those labels say we are, life would be so different. Like I truly believe that. Absolutely. So tell me about some of those wins that you've had, uh, not only with yourself, but with your clients as well. Talk to me about some of the wins you've had with your clients. So, <laughs> so I've got one, one of my clients that I've worked with, she was hilarious. She was, she was a young lady, mother of five. <laughs> Um, and she was, she was always exhausted. She said, I'm just so exhausted. I'm so exhausted. And so I, you know, and she couldn't, she, she wouldn't tell me why she was exhausted other than that, because I have five kids, because I have five kids. Okay. You have five kids. Anybody's going to be exhausted, but what are you doing to, to give yourself some self-care and self-energy? Oh, I just chase the kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what could you do different? so that you could have a little bit more energy for the kids. And the kids are ranged like from nine to one. And she said, I could give the older kids a little bit more responsibility. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you know, give them responsibility and they will start to do things around for you and you're not having to do as much and cleaning up behind them and everything. And so as she started implementing these things, she started realizing that even her, her, her ADHD, as she claimed she had, she said, you know, it's not that I'm ADHD. It's just, I'm just bouncing all the time because I got kids. I got too many kids. <laughs> so she's settled into a better, a better routine. And so now she's actually enjoying things that she likes to do, like her artwork and writing and things of that nature. And wow. for me, for me, my wins in my personal life have just been I have a whole new perspective on things. Like I don't let things bother me like they used to. I no longer go, well, I should have done this. Well, 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 well let, you know, maybe I should have done that. You know, I'm not second guessing myself anymore. Now, when I say I'm going to do something or I make a decision, boom, that's it. 
we're done. You know, good is good enough. <laughs> And the smile on your face, uh, absolutely. It just, it just screams <laughs> mind management and confidence. And, yeah. and well done, fantastic. So, to, to anyone, the, any, to all, everyone that's listening and things like that, especially when it comes to the labels, tell me how you. Fa- social media is, I think, is a great thing if you understand how to use the social media to feed uh, the positive beast, not the negative beast. But mm-hmm. there's a lot of things out there that are signs are signs you have ADHD. Mm-hmm. And if you were to go through the signs I have a- ADHD, <laughs> a narcissistic personality, or uh, something else, or another label, signs you have this, I'm like, I've got everything. Exactly. It's like it's you, just... you can you can find something in everything. You 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 know it, it's like the it's like the person that goes to the doctor because you know they're having foot pain or whatever. You know they they just can't get rid of that foot pain and you know they start going to Doctor Google and you know and researching all of their their symptoms and then next thing you know oh my God I'm gonna have to get my foot amputated. Why do you have to get your foot amputated? <laughs> Are you a doctor? Like, are you a real doctor? Did a real doctor with a medical degree tell you that you have to get your leg amputated? They're like, no, but Google said, okay, that's the one thing I wish (laughs) was not readily available to people is the ability to Google symptoms. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, the Google beast. Now, one of the things that we've we've been talking about with a lot of the businesses that we've been working with is, and and what they've be, are really appreciated is that that one of those things is when they come to a mind management coach, um, we actually do put out into the we don't diagnose you. you you're not nope. actually going to get a diagnosis when you come to us. We're not in a position to diagnose. You come to us with, well, I want to do this better, or I can't do this, and we we trace back. Well, why can't you do it? Uh, and then we we go through the mind management techniques to go well actually if you do this that'll go away and once you get down it's the layers of the onion it's exactly right what you said it's the layers of the onion is once you peel it back once you peel it down and you get down to the root of the problem which is what that is all about there the logo Mm -hmm. is once you get to the root Mm -hmm. the leaves start to flourish it's the root of the problem that we get to and that's why Mm -hmm. And I, we're always honest. I'm always honest with the clients. Is look, if we get to the root of the problem, it can be painful, like root canal surgery. Once you've had that five minutes of pain, you get to the root. We dig it out. There can be that emotional break. There can be that that absolute yeah. just release. That's the pain you felt it. Reframe it, and we move them on. And then that oh my god, now this doesn't happen. How how do you prep your clients for for you know helping them to feel it to heal it if you like. So I like to, I like to do the seven layers deep exercise with them when Mm -hmm. they tell me what they're experiencing and and what they're doing. And as we get through it, it can be a very emotional experience for them. You know, the first probably three or four answers are very superficial answers, but as you start to get deeper into it, by the time you're done or I'm done talking with the client, they are weeping and going, oh my God, I just did not connect the two together this is why I'm feeling the way that I feel and why I do the things that I do and so once we're able to identify that and I'll give you the perfect example in me um, I went through a really tough time in 2011 um, and it it was to the point that was the year that my um, my now ex-husband decided he didn't want to be married after 22 years I was having problems with uh, my supervisors at work. I was having problems with my employees. I was having problems with my children. And, you know, it was just a a mishmash of all kinds of things. And I ran away. I literally (laughs) moved to Germany to start a new life, thinking that would solve all of my problems. And as I started really, you know, when, when I was alone by myself and I started really examining my life and, and going through what it must be me, you know, he left me after 22 years, you know, my boss wasn't liking me and, you know, was giving me a bad performance rating for the first time in my life, even though I didn't feel that I deserved it. And I still don't deserve it. Um, No, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, But it it just, it was me. Like 
there's got to be something wrong with me. What is wrong with me? And so I started doing a timeline of everything good and everything bad that ever happened in my life. And by the time I got done with my whys, my root was my adopted mother Mm. and her feelings about me. I mean, she never, she, she made it very clear um, from early childhood that she didn't want me. It was her husband that wanted me. I was probably 18 months when they adopted me. We're still figuring that one out. And um, when he passed away, I was four years old. And she actually tried to get me back to the adoption agency. And it was that right there that has always driven me because she didn't want me. She tried to give me back like as if I was a shoe being returned to the store. And that right there drove all of my behaviors, all of my actions, all of my thoughts throughout the years. And I was in my 40s when I finally realized that. And and it became crystal clear. And from that moment, I was able to to move forward and go, it's not that she didn't want me. She didn't know how to be a mom. Mm -hmm. She wasn't ready to be a mom when, you know, her husband decided we're going to adopt a kid. Um, She wasn't ready. She was still young. But her fears of being a mom, her fears of screwing me up, they actually did screw me up. But it wasn't an intentional thing. You know, I can see from her point now, I mean, she's been, she's, she passed away years ago. So I've not had this conversation with her because I was in my forties when I finally realized this is why I was so screwed up all these years. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful thing to do when you can sit down and really examine the reason why you feel a certain way. I always had a fear of abandonment. I always had a fear of, of just not being liked. And so I always had to excel. I had to be the best at what I, you know, at what I did. I had to know it all. I had to be smarter than my supervisors. I had to be smarter than my ex-husband. I had to be smarter than everybody. Um, and at the end of the day, it was more of a detriment to me mm. because I didn't get to enjoy my life and I was living my life for everybody else. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Mary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honestly, Mary Denise, that was that was lovely. Literally retracing, going back to your whys, getting down. Uh, yeah, wow. Mm-hmm. It turns up in our life, and it's it's one of those things that when I'm explaining, we can train people to actually figure that out in 15 minutes mm-hmm. from conversations without people yeah. knowing, just to sit and actively listen and just go through, yep, yeah, can pretty much pinpoint what that problem is. <laughs> exactly. And that's the hard part is like, can I just have a chat? No, nope, they've, they've got to come to you. They can't have it like mm-hmm. that. You've got, they've mm-hmm. got, because that's when it becomes, it's like, well, I didn't want, no, you, nope, it's fine. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So that's the thing that we've been doing that with with some of our other coaches as well, mm-hmm. is you can absolutely crack people in 15 minutes. If you just mm-hmm. listen, the two points, and the two, three points, you're like, oh, wow, it just opens people up. It's unbelievable. That's that's the mm-hmm. power of my management. Look, you've shared a beautiful story with us. Is there anything else you want to share? I think that people need to just embrace who they are, love themselves, and know that the conditions and circumstances of your life, they don't define you. You define you. You have the power to rewrite the narrative and live a label-free life. You don't have to conform to societal expectations just because that's what you think you have to do. And if I was to ask you to stand tall and know your worth, would you do that? Absolutely. I do it every day now. (laughs) Your eyes went to the side. Your eyes went to the side. The question I have to ask is why stand and know in red? Because red is a very emotive color and it's a very powerful color and you have to stand and you have to know because too often we will, we will say we're standing, but we're, we're not, we're just that bystander in the crowd watching something happen instead of taking the action and doing for ourselves. Let's, do you know what? We're going to, this is going to be a really good thing. You have to take action. Yeah. 
this is what we've been talking about is accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability for so many people is a fearful thing. Because that, it, it, if if you hold somebody accountable, it drags up. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to do be able to do this. And mm -hmm. that, that when we use the word accountability, if you reframe it to taking inspired action, that's the accountability I have. Mm -hmm. Is by taking the action and moving forward, mm -hmm. you will absolutely make that change. So it's mm -hmm. that inspired action is your accountability. Mm -hmm. And it's what we fall down on so much because we're scared of accountability because we think there's a possibility of failure. There's a possibility yeah. of not being good enough, not holding us self. So accountability, the word, becomes quite fearful. Mm -hmm. And I know mm -hmm. that when I've been talking to my friends, I'm like, what's moved me forward and got me where I am in life is accountability. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen accountability as a fearful thing. I've seen it as an inspired action. No, I want to hold mm -hmm. myself accountable so I can move forward. And that's something that I think is missing in mm -hmm. in just so many people is if you hold yourself accountable and take that inspired action, knowing your worth and standing tall, you'll make massive changes in your life. And that's what mind yes, management does for people. Yep. yep. Absolutely. How do you feel about inspired action and accountability, Mary Denise? I, I have to agree. I mean, you said it beautifully i never thought about accountability from that perspective taking inspired action so that that's just triggered something within me and given me an idea for something that i want to do now um but you're right inspired action you know it's it's kind of like it's kind of like when you fall in love right or you meet that person for the first time you're you're doing your best right you're you're you're, you're getting dressed up you're 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 putting your best foot forward like you're taking that inspired action to get this person to like you but why are we not taking inspired action to like ourselves, to change ourselves? So, yeah, this is you, you're you're sending me down a down a little trail, Cuddy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I, I I do that with a with a lot of my clients. It's like we're going to hold you accountable to this. Oh, yeah. whoa, 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 whoa! They push back with the accountability. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no! Inspired this is a good action. thing. You have to come mm -hmm. back next week with. Well, this is why I couldn't write. I just need to know. I'll find out your belief system. Tell me why. We'll get to it. And then they come back. They went, no, I did it. I did it. In fact, I, I tell you a funny story about one of my clients. One of my clients had a fear of picking up the phone. She had a fear of oh. picking up the phone. She just knew it was irrational. We found out why in 20 minutes. And then we went straight to it. I went, right, okay, the next time that you don't want to answer your phone, you have to um, pick up the phone or buy a lottery ticket. She Ooh. went, well, I don't want to buy a lottery ticket. I went, why do you? She goes, well, I'm, it's not, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to buy a lottery ticket because I'm not going to win. I went, but you've got more chances of pink answering the phone and it not being bad news mm -hmm. than you have of winning the lottery. So every mm -hmm. time, and I held her accountable. She was a young girl. She was a young lady, 18 years old. And she just said to me, I'm not buying a lottery ticket. I went, not a problem. Every time you can't pick up the phone, pick up a lottery ticket. She got back in contact with a week after. She went, I didn't buy a lottery ticket. And I answered the phone seven times and nothing bad happened. So she got past a fear of anxiety. All yeah. because she had the accountability of me. I'm not buying a lottery ticket. Uh, yeah. and people don't understand the power of accountability. However you want to use it in, in metaphors or just, yeah, do this or do that. You you choose which you want to yeah. do, but I'm not accountable to it. Yeah. And they walk away with, well, I'm not doing that, so yeah. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Well, and it's also it's also kind of like the whole concept of when 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 you want to when you want to develop a habit, right? There's all these things that say, oh, it takes 21 days to develop a habit. Does it really take 21 days to develop a habit, or does it take repetition? So if I if I say I'm not going to drink, you know, diet cola anymore, and I and I purposely go into the convenience store. And I open the door to buy, you know, to buy the bottle. I'm going to pick it up and I'm put it back and pick it up and put it back. And I'm going to keep doing that until I realize, yeah, I don't want to drink this. So for me, developing that habit, it's not about how long is it going to take me? It's more of how repetitious can I be with this action so that I don't do it? And then it becomes second nature. And then next time I go in the convenience store, I walk right past the diet cola aisle and I don't have the craving for the cola anymore. You know, oh. it's kind of it's kind of like that inspired action <laughs> it's always inspired action inspired mm -hmm. action is 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 a really cool word for accountability mm -hmm. and, and holding people up mary denise 
Thank you very, very much. I think labels are for tins or cans. Yes. It's mm-hmm. a powerful thing for people to walk away with. And mm-hmm. you are absolutely killing it at Priority Mind Management. We know mm-hmm. everything that you're doing and you're you're, you're creating so much. Uh, and you're going to be a massive help to not just people in Arizona, but to the all lovely people. All over pe- the world. Well, all over the world. I wasn't going to say the United States of America, but you're absolutely right. All over the world. My goal and my intention is to be the premier mind management coach in the globe. Oh, and I'm going to hold you accountable to that. (laughs) I love that. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Well, as always, thank you very much for joining us. To everybody watching uh, another one of our podcasts uh, with our coaches uh, for Priority Mind Management, Um, highly trained, highly skilled Uh, exceptional coaches at what they do for supporting you personally, uh, your business from leaders to employees. It's all there for you. It's a powerful tool when you can, you can help the employees all the way up to the senior leaders with a skill that you have that, yeah, no, I've got the experience to deal with you, but I can also help that. I work with kids, believe it or not, Mary Denise. Mm -hmm. A lot of my clients at this moment in time are kids. Mm -hmm. We've been able to do that. So, yeah, no, it's a powerful tool that works on so many levels. Mm-hmm. So, look, thank you very much, Mary Denise. Thank you. As always. Thank you very much. Yes, as always. Enjoy the beautiful heat of Arizona, which I'm sure is scorching at this moment in it time. Is. It is. It's scorching. <laughs> it's scorching in the winter, so I'm sure it's going to be scorching uh, at this time. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. As always, big love from Cuddy. Uh, prior to my management, and we will see you on the next podcast with one of our coaches. All the best.